Okay, so our next presentation comes from Jennifer Hunt. And Jennifer's dog Jed and her passion for animal welfare inspired Pet Medical Crisis in 2010. With a deep understanding of the challenges faced by pet owners in times of financial hardship, Jennifer established this compassionate charity in order to provide life-saving veterinary care to pets in need. Her unwavering commitment to both human and animal health has earned her widespread recognition and gratitude from countless families whose beloved companions have received essential medical treatment. Jennifer's trailblazing efforts have made a profound impact on the lives of both pets and their owners, the veterinary community and animal welfare organisations. So thank you, Jennifer, to present Keeping People and Pets Together, Preserving the Human-Pet Bond. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to just start with um, thanking Uncle John for the welcome to country. And um, I don't know if it's a fun fact, but in travelling from Melbourne, where I live, um, to this amazing place, we travelled across 22 different lands that had traditional owners. And uh, it's an absolute privilege to be here on this land today. Um, I'd also like to just start by asking everyone in the room for a show of hands as to how many people have actually heard of Pet Medical Crisis and the work that we do. So there are, there are a few people here, so that, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, this is a, a, a picture of me and my border collie, Jed. And uh, Jedi was a profoundly important member of our family. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about how the, the charity started. So Jed um, was, I was just minding my own business as a registered nurse walking along a beach in, in Mornington. And Jed pulled up sore and I thought, gosh, what's wrong with him? He was sitting in a very strange way. And we ended up at an emergency department and uh, they said to me he'd ruptured three discs in his back and did I want to have him put to sleep? And I was thinking, well, I'm a registered nurse and we fix people and let's fix pets and get him off to surgery. And so the first, first time I realised it was going to be $10,000, but um, oh, I've always been well, I've always been able to work. Um, and I was, we were saving for a kitchen renovation and I said, just get him off to surgery and get, get his surgery done. So he, he woke up um, as a partial paraplegic uh, Jetty was incredibly important to us. My husband had bone marrow cancer at the time and he was integral to our family. And I blame you, Mike, for making me teary from the previous presentation. <laughs> um, so, yes, Jetty was incredibly important. So we got him over the line. Donald then snapped a femur in his leg from his... Um, he had cancer. And then Jed did another disc. So we were in for a penny, in for a pound with Jed, another $10,000. We got him sorted. Donald then, in competition, snapped another femur on the other side. So we had wheelchairs and harnesses. And, and um, my dog, um, my son was about four. He was sort of coming along, along the journey as well. Um, we got everyone back walking and I said no one would ever think anything was wrong with this family and that was a silly thing to say because the next day Jed ruptured another disc. So $30,000 later, um, but we couldn't have a new kitchen and not, not have Jed there. And on his third surgery, I said to the vets, what do you do for pensioners? I, don't, I didn't actually know any pensioners except for my son's grand, uh, grandmother who was an aged pensioner. And they said something I didn't want to hear and that was euthanasia and surrender. So I thought, well, we best do a little bit of something about that and create a fund to help pensioners in need. So there's, there's my son, James, as a four-year-old, uh, walking Jetty in a sling. And um, we were very fortunate to have Jed for another nine years, and I was grateful for every single step we took together. Um, Donald sadly passed away when James was six years old. So our charity um, is called Pet Medical Crisis and we're a lifeline for pensioners in crisis and a lifesaver for pets at risk. 
And our mission really is about keeping people and pets united in health and preserving that human pet bond and funding veterinary care for pensioners' pets. So the, the impact of the human-animal bond, I think we all know it, is very is profound. And as, as Mike has let us see today, the, the difference that um, people and pets together can make. And it, it creates an unwavering companionship, unconditional love, and an overall health and well-being. And this is a photo of one of our clients uh, just in the last couple of months. That's Bruce and Giorgio. Giorgio had fractured his um, leg for the second time in his life above a fracture um, a plate in his arm that should have been removed and the, there was a fracture distal to that. Um, Bruce lives in a bed sit. Um, he survives on a disability pension. He has Parkinson's and uh, is doing incredibly well at 81 to still be alive, but Giorgio is his life. And the only option he had with $300 in his pocket the only option offered to him by the veterinary community was euthanasia. Um, and he sat there, he sat in a, a veterinary emergency department for eight hours saying, you don't understand, you don't understand. That dog is everything to him. So um, the following, oh, fortunately I was contacted and went to see him. He had no mobile phone that could um, access any technology or an application to our charity. Uh, he lived reasonably close to me. I popped over, we took some photos, I reassured him and um, I got Giorgio off to the vet the next morning after having done a fundraiser on Facebook, uh, which I started just before the Matildas were to play and we finished it just after the Matildas lost uh, with another $2,500 in kitty and $1,000 from the charity. So Giorgio um, got got his surgery and was returned home and they are incredibly grateful. Uh, this is another one of our, our lovely clients in, who's been with us in the last couple of months. This is Galena and uh, she's very happy for us to use her photos here. And um, her, her um, love for her little dog Shatsy is just so profound. And Andrea, can you play that? My precious one. Mm. Yes, he is. He's my angel. Yeah. Yeah. We keep each other alive. Yeah. <laughs> so the audio there's a little bit slower, or the, the video is not quite as profound, but that just shows you exactly what is going on there. This lady lives in a very destitute uh, situation. And with, uh, I took her and uh, one of our social work students from RMIT to um, get her little dog attended to and we're going to make sure that they stay together and are well. So what happens when critical veterinary care is inaccessible for pet owners in financial hardship? So there's, there's a list of things that really happen. So we, we know that pets can face being euthanised, which is a... a if you've got a saveable pet, it's really unfortunate. It's a terrible situation to have a pet unnecessarily euthanised. For our pensioners, 75% uh, of our clientele are either renting or homeless. So they will default on rent. Um, I think 96% of our clients will go without to ensure that pets receive the care that they need. They cut down on food and utilities and seek deeper into depression and anxiety with this feeling that there's no way out, no, no help, and that they're getting deeper and deeper into a state of poverty. Pets are left to suffer and uh, otherwise are surrendered to pounds, shelters or rescues. And by acting proactively, we can prevent that from happening. This is another of our cases from about six months ago and Zeus belonged to uh, George, I think it was George, who had um, failed back surgery. So he had been working, um, had a, an injury and ended up with a chronic pain syndrome. So from a physical injury, he ended up with a mental health illness as well. Zeus then um, was a huge part of their family, but unfortunately swallowed a, a toy. 
and in taking him to an emergency department without any funds to help with veterinary care, the only suggestion was euthanasia or surrender and the family surrendered him and at the same time we're getting in touch with our charity. So uh, we donated $1,000 straight off and worked with the emergency department who were very reluctant to return him to the family. Um, and we advocated strongly that this dog didn't, needed to go home. There were children involved. He was loved. There was no reason, you know, and they said that they would further explore it. So uh, that surrender was reversed two weeks later and the owner said, uh, I've got a nice audio of him saying, I can't believe it, you are freaking amazing. So that's as much thanks as we really need. So what do we do and how we do it? So, Part of uh, what Pet Medical Crisis does is to really act in a timely fashion and it's so important for us not to say, look, we'll discuss that tomorrow and get back to you. We need to act really quickly. So we take timely action to prevent vulnerable families from losing their beloved pets, their homes and their whole world in times of hardship. Uh, we alleviate financial and emotional stress. So the owner applies um, online um, on our website. There's an application form there and that information goes into a database so that we can really reflect well on what we are, what we are doing. Um, PMC case managers then triage the cases. So 64% of our cases require urgent veterinary care within 12 hours. There is no time to be waiting around if you've got a pyometra um, that's in danger, if you've got fractures, traumas, uh, foreign bodies swollen or snake, particularly snake bites. Uh, vets determine the treatment needed and they act, we ask them to act as not for profit as possible and uh, we work with some amazing vets um, who support us really well. And pets, uh, pet medical crisis advocate and bridge the gap to create a positive solution for the pet, the owner and the vet, vets and the wider community as well. So uh, we're pretty proud to look at our stats and say that in um, every month we prevent about 22 euthanasias or surrenders just with clients coming through pet medical crisis. So as I said, we work with some pretty amazing vets and uh, you'll be hearing from Dr Beck in the next uh, presentation. Um, our vets support us. There's um, Dr Karen Davids as well at Southern Animal Health and uh, we work with lots of vets across. We, we can't do it without our, our wonderful veterinary community. This is a, a picture of Victoria. We are only in Victoria at this stage. I think we have a plan to, to go national one day and we're chipping away at doing that. But that's a picture of Victoria. We've worked with over 200 different veterinary clinics across the whole of Victoria. So we try and make our, ourselves as accessible as possible that people can um, any vet in Victoria, any owner in Victoria or their, their families can get in touch. And there's a positive impact then on the pet, the pensioner, vets, and of course shelters, pounds and rescue organisations. Uh, we also empower our community. So this is a, a picture here of Katie and her beautiful dog Rocky. We uh, spent probably 18 months keeping Rocky alive and um, she, Katie has some um, physical and mental health issues but, and she was struggling to walk him. So we got Pet Links involved and they got their dog walker involved. And for the first time uh, when he was about two, she was able to walk him effectively and um, you can see the smile on her face there. She's just, just so proud and uh, he's such a beautiful dog. Uh, we advocate for change. So uh, this is Dana, with, uh, that's Dr Beck there as well, doing um, her amazing work as usual. And um, we leverage our research. So I'm a researcher in my, in my old life. I'm a registered nurse and I, I do a lot of research. And we love our data. So it, it really creates a big difference and it enables us to work with animal welfare organisations, animal management organisations, um, established other charities and government um, and Australia-wide communities. So working together, as Mike was saying in his presentation, it's so important as part of what we're all doing. So who we support, this is a little look at our data. 80% um, of our clients are female, and uh, we can speculate, I suppose, on, on why that might be. 64% dogs, 
89% of pensioners relying solely on their pension. So if they're presented with needing to pay for a veterinary bill when they're already renting and they're just living week to week and with the cost of living rising, there is no wiggle room. It's a really, really tough space for them to be in. 67% of our pensioners had less than $50 in a time of crisis. So what do you do? You know, you've got a pet that's broken its leg like uh, Bruce had experienced. It's an absolute life crisis for people. 43% of pensioners were on disability pension. Uh, when I started the charity, I thought we'd just be helping a few aged care pensioners and it's uh, certainly our disability sector that really need, um, seem to need the most help. 75% of pensioners were renting or homeless. 38%, so this is a huge number, reported in the application that they had been victim survivors of domestic violence. And we find that's a huge number, but that, that can be historic as well as current. And a massive 83% of our clients had a diagnosed mental health illness. So that's anxiety or depression or a greater... Um, more severe mental health illness such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, and their pets are absolutely integral to helping their mental health. So let's just, I'll just show you quickly what sort of cases that we deal with. This is in 2022 to 23, we funded uh, 317 cases and uh, we had 820 applications, I think. So by and far, every year, year on year, we have dentals as the most required surgery and our veterinary um, friends tell us that dentals are often their bread and butter. So big, big call on our dentals. Uh, I, I used not to do dentals um, until I realised the importance of them for, for pets and their quality of life. Orthopaedics, also large, medical, eye and ear, foreign bodies. All these pets eating, cats and dogs, both eating foreign bodies. Uh, in there, we have pyometra and mammary cancers. And these are both preventable illnesses. The charity spends about $30,000 a year on pyometra. I think I had four last week. And um, it's an infection of the uterus where a pet can die within 24 to 48 hours if they don't get urgent surgery. Uh, some clinics will charge $3,000 for a pyometra or more. Um, we have uh, Port Phillip Animal Hospital and Southern Animal Health who will charge $850, which is a huge discount and it enables us to spend our money in the best way and get the best outcome for our, our people and their pets. Uh, breathing problems, bowel issues, snake, poison. We, I'm on um, speed dial to a few vets, um, Delatite vet in particular, ring only in the summertime, and then I know exactly why they're ringing. It's a snake bite, there's no time to mess around, $1,000, give the antivenine. Um, bird crop and FIP, so um, that's a feline infectious peritonitis. So th this is the um, graph of what happened from 2010 when I first started the charity and how things have increased. 2017 is a very low year. It's the year that Jed passed away and I just didn't have capacity to do much. In 2019, I started taking on some help and you can see what that help has done. And we have Tasha here today who's just done such an amazing job for the charity and uh, we are really punching above our weight. The the Red area there are also the cases. So as I said, for 2023, we had 820 applications. Every single application is responded to. Everyone gets a one-on-one -on -one case manager who will carry them through the process and uh, no, no inquiry gets is unanswered. So our impact is pretty strong, uh, we, we believe, and certainly collecting data. I also started collecting um, I was telling people, we're going to help you with your pet's health. We're going to donate $1,000 or whatever the amount might be. And I was getting all these people crying on the phone and telling me how, how grateful they were. So I started to uh, record those audios to share with the team. So I wasn't just getting that Tats Lotto moment of telling people. So um, this little cat here, we've got one of the audios here. Uh, this is one of our um, mental health clients whose little cat had a py um, 
pyrexia, so a high temperature, and could not afford to go to the, the vet um, to be seen, so he'd used all his money. And Andrew, are you able to play that? You're living at home? Yeah, I live with my mum and dad. My mum's my carer, but she's on a pension as well. <laughs> So how yep. would it be if Pet Medical Crisis donates $410? That would be fantastic. Would that help? And we can get her in... Uh, okay. Does that sound like a reasonable plan? Yeah, thank you. You are right? Yeah. Sorry, it's just been a big, big day. Yes, darling. She's very important to isn't she? Yes. Sorry. That's all right. So that's Richard. So we got little Elle off to um, the vet the next day and all was well. So he's just, we get that constant, you know, um, people being so grateful uh, that someone's there to help, to listen and um, to make things work. So what we've learnt... Uh, there's this saying, if you can't afford a pet, you shouldn't have one. And from the beginning, I've heard that. Uh, we strongly disagree with that. So 96% uh, of our clients uh, will go without to make sure their pets get the very best care. Um, I was talking to um, Pam Ahern from Edgar's Mission the other day and she, uh, we were talking about the charity and, and how important pets are to people. And she said they can't afford not to have one. And I said, I'm going to use that, Pam, so that's up there. And uh, we have a great social return on investment, which really amplifies our impact. So since I had that fateful day of walking Jetty on the beach, the charity has now distributed over a million dollars in veterinary care to assist about oh, over, well over 2,000 Victorian pensioners' pets. And we've partnered with over 200 veterinary clinics, prevented unnecessary euthanasias and surrenders and kept thousands of pensioners and pets united in health with a, a social return on investment of nearly $6 million. Um, our collaboration and support is key. So we can't do this like everyone here, we can't do it alone. So um, no challenge is insurmountable when we all work together and working with animal welfare organisations, veterinary clinics, supporters, donors, and the community is so important for all of us. And by fostering these connections, sharing resources and pooling strengths, we can amplify our impact and overcome barriers that otherwise might seem insurmountable. So where to from here? Pet medical crisis is going to keep evolving. As I said, we, we sort of have a, in mind that we'd like to be a national entity and uh, we're working towards that. Uh, evolving, measuring our impact, so again, gathering data and um, helping our two and four-legged communities to stay together. So we hope to be bridging the gap in basic veterinary care for pensioners, empowering our clients, so we, we often uh, try and make it that the clients, some of them, uh, for many years, I only did donations that people didn't have to pay anything back, um, we now give people the opportunity, if they would like to donate back, they feel very much empowered that they are creating the solution. And some people pay us back $5 a month. And, and you know, we ring them up and thank them for that. That's amazing. Uh, we want to amplify our impact through collaboration and expand and support to interstate. And that's a picture of Georgie Purcell from the Animal Justice Party. So we're working with them and would like to contribute to the Vetticare initiative in Victoria. So thank you all very much. And um, yeah, certainly by intervening and reducing surrenders, saving treatable pets and fostering compassion, we can contribute to a brighter future together. And I'd just like to now ask everyone to just do a quick Quick hands up, who now has heard about Pet Medical Crisis and the work we do? <laughs> ah, great. <laughs>